in this line five here with break five. And then if we continue, we get to the breakpoint here. And welcome back. We've pushed our non-working implementation of Redo to GitHub, and now it's time to figure out why it's not working using GHCI's debugger. So we can start the debugger with GHCI Redo, Redo being the name of the file we want to debug. And this is the same as entering GHCI normally and calling load redo. To enter the debugger, we can use step, but we need to specify the function we want to step into because main isn't assumed. And everything linked, but we didn't end up in the debugger. And this is because GHCI can only debug interpreted modules. And right now, redo is loaded as compiled. So we can get around this by loading redo with an asterisk in front. Or another way to do this is to quit and remove the uh, compiled file. And you can see that now we're also in an interpreted module. So now we can step into main. And we have our first clue that the debugger is a little bit different than most line-oriented imperative debuggers. This line here is telling us that, that the area under observation is line three, column eight, up to line five, column 11. And if we look at the source code, this corresponds to the do block here, from the beginning of the do block to the end of the do block. So if we step again, we're now at line four, columns eight through 41, which are everything to the right of this assignment arrow. And if we step once more, we're now looking at columns 24 through 41, which is this shell call here. Now, these lines here, underscore result, have been showing us the type of the result that we're going to get from the area or the expression that we're looking at. And the underscore to the right of the equal sign here is showing us that we don't know what that result is yet. So in GHCI's debugger, you can use names that are in scope just like you would if you were entering code interactively. Uh, but we've got an error here that there's no show instance for create process. And we could solve that, but I'm not gonna go into that right now. What we can do instead is use the print command to print the result. But what we have here, underscore T1, is an unevaluated result right now. So we need to force that to see what it is. And it worked, but what we see isn't really all of that useful, at least not for figuring out what's going wrong here. Now, our program is pretty small and we don't have much to step through, but in a larger program, especially with more complex lines, the stepping can feel endless. So what we can do instead is set a breakpoint on this line five here with break five. And then if we continue, we get to the breakpoint here. Um, it's a little bit obscured here because it actually compiled and linked, but you can see that we're stopped at line five, column three through 11. And if we step again, we've completed the program. But wait a minute, if you look closely, this line here, compiling main, linking redo, this is not a message from GHCI. It's a message from GHC on the shell, which means that the program might have actually worked this time. And if we take a look here, you can see the program was just updated. Uh, running redo also seems to work. So two different things have happened here. One is that we're getting different behavior in the debugger than before. And this is one of the problems with debugging is that sometimes just the act of debugging a program can create different results. In this case, you might have already guessed it, but create process forks a child process. And under normal execution, 
there's not enough time for the shell command to run before we reach the end of the program and exit. Whereas when we're debugging the program and put a breakpoint on line 5, that gives the program enough time to run the shell command. And that's the output that we see above here, compiling main linking redo, while we're on that breakpoint. So why is redo working now when we run it from the command line? where it wasn't before. Well, it turns out that I had gotten halfway through recording this video under a Linux VM running Arch Linux. And before recording the first video, I'd run a system update to bring in the latest version of GHC. And halfway through the episode, I needed to restart the VM and found out that it had broken, the last update had broken a large number of things, including X. And after playing around with it for a while, I decided to go ahead and just build a FreeBSD VM, since FreeBSD is what I use personally. And the difference in behavior we're seeing now is either that the FreeBSD kernel is behaving a little bit differently, or some aspect of the system is changing the timing here. But I think this is a good reminder of why it's good to test on different systems and also that timing issues and race conditions can exist in your code and you may never notice it on one development machine, even though uh, it might be happening in production somewhere else. So let's not be content that it just happens to be working now. Let's actually fix this. Let's take a look at Hoogle for create process and see what it has to say about it. Create process the function in system.process. So there's mention that it spawns an external process. It doesn't give specifics on how it does that, but there's probably a function that allows us to wait on that process. And we can either look through system process on Hoogle. We, there's a section here, process completion, wait for process, that sounds like that's what we want. Or we could actually browse through the module in GHCI, which I'll get into another time. So for now, we know that we need wait for process, and we need a process handle that we should be getting probably from create process. So let's look at that again. So create process gives us three handles here and then a process handle. The three handles are for standard in, standard out, and standard error, which we don't care about. And then we get the process handle. So then we can wait for the process. And if we look at the type of wait for process, we get an exit code, which we're going to ignore for now, and just return. So let's see if that compiles. We'll run redo to rebuild itself. See that the timestamp changed. Run it again. And it looks good. All right, so the next step I can think of in making this prototype useful is actually not hard coding the target name here. We could accept the redo target on the command line as an argument. So we can get that with get args, which gives us a list of arguments. And we could check to see that we've received one and no more than one argument and print out an error or usage line if we didn't. But I think it's easier to just run the steps on every argument we've received. So if we get zero arguments, then nothing will happen. If we get one, then it'll work like normal. If we get two arguments, I don't see any harm in going ahead and running redo for both of the arguments we've gotten. So let's break out the code below into a separate function, and we'll call it redo. Let's go ahead and add a type annotation on this while we're at it. And this will just be, uh, it's gonna have to run in the IO monad, and it's going to take the target as a string so we can go ahead and take out the target here. And now we can map 
redo over the arguments. So let's see how that works. We have a compile error because we don't have a do block here. Get args not in scope. And get args is, let's see. part of system.environment I like to keep my imports organized in alphabetical order for the most part and I actually like to explicitly show what I'm importing from each module this um, is a bit unusual probably and it can be a bit of a, main, uh, a pain to maintain, but I think it makes maintaining the code in the future a little bit easier if you're not familiar with all the names in the file where they're being imported from. Other people like to import everything qualified, so they'd say import qualified system process as maybe SP, and so everything in the code from there would be prefixed with SP, and I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I just think it makes the code a little bit ugly to look at. Uh, we have an error here on line seven, and that's because the result of map M is a list. We really want nothing here. So let's try that. Okay, now when we run redo, nothing happens, but if we give it an argument name, it works. And just to test things out, we'll give it an, a valid argument and then an invalid one. And we get an error, which for now seems perfectly fine. And I think we've made enough progress to warrant going ahead and checking this in and tagging it. And I know I said I'm going to try to be editor agnostic, but using git from the command line just seems a little bit tedious to me. I prefer to use... Uh, Emacs maggot for this. So this shows us which files are untracked. We want to go ahead and ignore all of these and then add git ignore. And then we can look at what has changed here in our code and make sure it makes sense. So let's go ahead and commit this. So we fixed race condition added redo target command line option. And then let's tag this as episode two. So time to push. Now it may feel like we're making slow progress. I mean, the code is some 10 or 12 lines, but I've developed the habit of really thinking carefully about each feature or change I'm going to make, limiting myself to that single change and then testing it until I'm sure that it's working. And I think that that will keep us moving along steadily each video, rather than getting to a point where we're gonna be bogged down chasing errors and refactoring the code. In the next episode, we'll continue making the prototype more useful and expanding it to implement more of the spec for Redo. Also, since I'm not a big fan of switching to the browser to use Google and look things up, I'm going to show you a way that you can set it up to search through the documentation directly in GHCI. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you then.